I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, another firestorm set off by the Israeli Knesset, which has much of diaspora Jewry in an absolute outrage. One thing you can count on in the Jewish world, it's never boring. So what did the Israeli Knesset do? It passed a new basic law. Israel, as I'm sure many of you know, has no constitution. It has, of course, a marvelous Declaration of Independence, which is an iconic part of modern Jewish life, but Israel has no constitution. The closest thing that comes to an Israeli constitution are a set of basic laws, which can only be passed or rescinded by a majority vote in the entire Knesset. The Knesset, the Israeli parliament, has 120 seats, so a basic law must be ratified or amended or rescinded by at least 61 votes. Now, as of Thursday, July 19th, Israel has a new basic law, which affirms that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Knesset passed a basic law with 62 Knesset members voting for this basic law. 55 voted against it. Three Knesset members abstained. But the Knesset has now passed a basic law affirming that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Some Jews might ask, hasn't Israel always been the nation state of the Jewish people. What's new here? And why do those voting for this new basic law believe it was necessary now? Now, I want you to see exactly what this basic law says. There are Jewish groups in America horrified by this basic law. There are Jews who've been thus far passionate supporters of the state of Israel who've loved Israel unconditionally, but who now say they can no longer do so, that at best their love will now be conditional. Many of you may hear and see discussions about this new basic law without ever having seen what's in it, so I want to take a moment to show you what's in this new Israeli law. There are 11 articles or planks in the law entitled Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Article 1 lays out three basic principles that are the philosophical foundations of the state of Israel. A, the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people. B, the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people in which it fulfills its natural, cultural, religious, and historical right to self-determination and C, the right to exercise national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. I'm not sure what this statement means. I assume the exercise of national self-determination is a characteristic of many groups of people, and it's a phrase often used when discussing the Palestinians' right to have a homeland of their own. The second article describes the symbols of the Jewish state. Its name is Israel. It has a flag, a state emblem, a state anthem, and that all state symbols are determined by Israeli law. Article 3 deals with the sensitive issue of Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish state, stating Israel Complete and united is the capital of Israel. In terms of any peace process with the Palestinians, everyone acknowledges that Jerusalem is an issue to be resolved as part of direct negotiations. This article of Israel's basic law might seem to take Jerusalem out of the negotiation process and therefore could be one of the articles that evokes considerable criticism. Though most groups criticizing this basic law, the AJC, the URJ, Federations of North America, 
don't mention Article 3. We'll see if it becomes an issue going forward. What seems to trouble critics more is Article 4, which changes Israeli life. Article 4 states that from now on, Hebrew, and only Hebrew, is Israel's state language, and that Arabic will no longer be a state language. Rather, Arabic will now have a, quote, special status, unquote. But it will not be the state language. And on some public signs where there used to be Hebrew, Arabic, and English, only Hebrew and English are now there. Article 4 of the law ends by saying this change does not harm the status given to the Arabic language, although it certainly appears to do so. This article is one of the most controversial in the basic law. Article 5 says that Israel will be open to Jewish immigration. Nothing seems to be new there. Article 6 talks about the connection Israel has to diaspora Jewry as a haven of safety for Jews all over the world. And Israel pledges to strengthen ties between diaspora Jewry and the Jewish state. Again, nothing seems new here. Then we come to Article 7, which affirms the right of Jewish settlement, saying that Israel encourages settlement expansion as a national value. This raises all kinds of red flags among those Jews who are unilaterally opposed, I'm sorry, unalterably opposed to Jewish settlements. Article 8 affirms that the Jewish calendar will be used in Israel alongside the Gregorian calendar. Again, nothing new there. Article 9 lists Israel public holidays, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel Independence Day, and Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day. Again, nothing new in Article 9. Article 10 affirms that the Shabbat is a day of rest in Israel, and that the details of Shabbat observance will be determined by the Knesset. Again, nothing new here. And the last article, Article 11, simply states that this basic law, as with all Israeli basic laws, shall not be amended except by a majority vote in the Knesset, which is nothing new. So eight of the 11 articles of this basic law establishing Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people seem to have nothing new, to have no practical effect. Nothing has changed on the ground in the life of the Israeli people. While the three that do concern Jerusalem, the elimination of Arabic as a state language, and settlement expansion. So how radical are these three articles? And how radical is the entire basic law affirming that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people? And for us at JBS, for JBS viewers, the question should be asked, how are Israelis reacting to the passage of this new basic law. Do Israelis support it? Do Israelis oppose it? Do Israelis care one way or the other? Well, for some insight into this sensitive area, I'm so pleased to have now on our JBS phones from Israel, the brilliant political correspondent and analyst, and analyst, analyst for the Israeli news website, The Times of Israel, a real audience favorite here at JBS, Chaviv Retegur. Chaviv, thank you so much for joining us once again. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So first, Chaviv, I want you to have a moment. Do you feel I summarized this basic law fairly? Are there any things you want to correct in how I presented it? Um, 
you know, this gets into the discussion. Um, every every article, and also many of the articles that are missing, a lot of stuff got left on the wayside in the course of the parliamentary debate. Um, it's worth mentioning this law, is its origins are in 2007. This is something that has been percolating and developing and being negotiated. It's a very short law. You pretty much read its entirety. It is, it is a single printed page. But it contains all of the sort of major headlines um, of, of Israel's sort of Jewish national identity. A lot is there. A lot is not there. A lot is controversial. A lot is very obvious. Um, so I can't answer the question. Okay. <laughs> fair, en- fair there's, enough. There's so much here. I, I understand. Uh, I want to clarify something that Khaviv said because I did not say it and you should know. What Khaviv is referring to is that the basic law that's been passed now by the Knesset has evolved. It's been in evolution for uh, almost 10 years. And what we have now is a redaction. And many people have reacted, Chaviv, not to this literal law, but they bring to it objections they had to the various permutations of this law. And that, I think, is what you were trying to tell our audience. This is a distilled, shorter version, but certainly critics of this law in Israel as well as in the diaspora are bringing their knowledge of what the law might have had. I don't know if that's fair, Chaviv. This is the law that was passed. But you're absolutely correct to sort of give our audience the larger context. So we'll take a little bit step by step. First of all, how do you read the Israeli people's reaction? What are Israelis saying on the street, Khaviv? Um, I think, tragically, um, the response is extremely partisan. Uh, people on the right are very happy. People um, on the left or in the center are very worried. Um, and I say tragically because this is not an ordinary political act. This is not an ordinary piece of legislation. When you pass a constitutional statement or a you know, semi-constitutional statement, this is what passes for a constitution in Israel, about the identity of the Jewish state, about what Jewish means, that feels like it should be something... Um, not unanimous. You'll never get Jews to be unanimous about anything, but uh, but certainly uh, uh, some sort of consensus, some mm-hmm. sort of mainstream. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not. Uh, it, Israel is, is deeply divided over this bill, over the need for the bill, over what the bill represents. Um, not just you know, there have been a lot of specific fights over specific articles in the bill. Some are still in. Some are gone. Uh, but but even just in general about the whole idea of passing this bill. So I think this is something that divides Israel, uh, and and it's and it's a, one of those one of those moments when a nation talks not about a specific policy where we can all have a debate and and, and the reality that the true the best policy is probably some combination of different sides. A lot of criticisms are valid on both sides. This is really a bill about aspirations, about dreams. What do we want Israel to be? And so there's nobody who's wrong here. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think the American Jewish Committee or ADL or, or some of the more left-leaning organizations in the United States and some of the really harsh critics of this bill are, are wrong. Uh, and I don't think that some of the uh, sort of smarter people on the Israeli right who, who are pushing this bill, uh, member of Knesset Avi Dichter, the former head of the Shin Bet, is not a right-wing you know, populist. He's a thoughtful, calm, uh, considered man, uh, he wants a two-state solution, uh, even though he, uh, he is a Likud member of Knesset, but he used to be in the centrist Kadima. And he's actually the member of Knesset who is the proposer of the bill officially. So uh, people like him have very serious and thoughtful reasons for wanting this bill. And again, it's about the vision of Israel. And so, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is not a policy debate. It's okay. a debate between, between visions. I, okay. I want you to help us. Again, very often, I've turned to you because here in America, we have at best a skewed view of what's going on in Israel. And we get our sense of it from whatever we read or hear 
in various Israeli media sources, including the Times of Israel, but there are sources on the left and on the right. And then in America, there has been really an explosion of outrage by many American Jewish organizations. And you know, URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism, is seen as being on the left. AJC, the American Jewish Committee, that's fairly centrist. JFNA may be center left, but there are people who are very, very upset. And I want, you, know, you heard me say, as I read this basic law, without going into the iterations before it got passed, I only saw three things in it, which I felt were not ho-hum. Hasn't this always been true? Who would disagree with them? I want you to explain to me, first, am I being simplistic? Do you feel that when, it, you know, when this bill says that we have an Israeli flag that's two blue stripes with a mug and David in the middle, and our national anthem is Hatikva, and we've got the seven-branch menorah as the national symbol, blah, 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 and that Jew, you know, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. I look at it and I say, I don't even know, I don't know why this is in any way interesting to anyone. Certainly, why would it create a rumble? I want you to tell me if I'm missing something because there is a philosophical underpinning which American Jewry, and myself included, might not understand. Okay, so let's do this. <laughs> um, let's take it from the top. Um, the part that you mentioned now, the obvious parts, the symbols, the very statement that Israel not just is the nation state of the Jewish people, but that only the Jews get to have national collective rights as a nation in the state of Israel. That is to say, the state of Israel is the state of the Jewish people. It can have non-Jewish minorities with complete equality in, in civil rights and human rights. They get a vote, they get every single the right to free speech, assembly, press, etc. Every right they want, they don't get national rights. Okay, hold on, the, hold, on hold on, hold on, hold on one second. Yeah. Sloan, I want you to put back up um, Article 1 because Khaviv has better defined Part C of Article 1, the right to exercise national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. It's not that national determination is unique. What Chaviv is explaining is the only people who have a right to self-determination in the state of Israel is the Jewish people. Do I have it right, Chaviv? Of, of, of national self-determination. Yeah, by the way, so what's interesting there? Why isn't that self-evident? This is the origins of the bill, of the law. The law begins after, in 2006 and 2007, there are various documents produced by the leaders of the Arab-Israeli uh, community. Uh, this is a community that represents uh, 15 to 20 percent of the Israeli population. And uh, they have a, an activist leadership um, that, uh, that has a lot of organizations that uh, our viewers may be uh, familiar with, Adala, Musawa, and they produced documents in the 2000s that talked about uh, a, a plan, a political vision of Israel, that Israel would stop being the nation state of the Jewish people. It would stop having the law of return. It would stop having, which is, you know, special um, migration rights for Jews. It would stop having uh, symbols that are Jewish symbols and would, in fact, become a state of what they call of all its citizens or a binational state, a state that is both defined as a state for the Jews and defined as a state for its Arab citizens. And those would be two national communities with equal rights, or there would be no national identity at all, and it would just be a state for all of its citizens, wherever they happen to be. Now, those documents set off a firestorm among Israeli Jews and led to some activists on the center-right, on the right-right, uh, to start contemplating, we're talking about 2007, 2008, producing a constitutional statement that says, no, you Arab Israeli leaders who are deciding that, who, who have this vision of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza that is for Palestinians and is Palestinian national self-determination, and then the Jewish state that is a state of all its citizens, in other words, there is no place in this land for Jewish self-determination, 
you leaders are incorrect, and we're going to clarify this point to you in a constitutional nation-state bill. This is the very first version of the bill brought to the Knesset, I believe, in 2008 um, by a then Kadima member of Knesset, a centrist member of Knesset named Avi Dichter. This is a bill that was not considered right-wing at the time. It had the signatures as sponsors of people like Nachman Shai, Fuad Ben Eliezer, members of the Labour Party. Uh, it had 20 out of the 28 Knesset members of Kadima in the center, and then it had quite a few right-wing MKs. But it really was an across-the-board bill at its beginnings. And it was a bill meant to respond to what many Israeli Jewish sort of political activists viewed as a challenge to the Jewish nation-state as an idea by the leadership of the Israeli Arab community. That's the beginnings of the bill. And therefore, Article 1, Section C is the essence, is the origin, is the reason the bill was created in the first place. Everything else, then, of course, you're going to pass a constitutional statement about the identity of the country. Suddenly you launch every kind of agenda, every kind of um, you know vision, all suddenly compete to get in and start pushing each other out and a lot of elbowing, and it took you know 10 years uh, to produce what we have now, and there's a great deal to talk about on Arabic, on Jerusalem, on, on settlement, all the things that you mentioned, which I think you're right, uh, those are things that are very interesting, very important, may, very controversial, maybe also very problematic. Um, but that's the beginning. That's where this comes from. Okay. okay. Uh, I appreciate the explanation, but forgive me, I don't see the therefore. It seems, as you described it, first of all, it's so interesting that our audience should hear this. You just heard Khaviv says, this started out not as a right-wing bill, it would be interesting for you to tell us, Khaviv, at what point did it morph into a right-wing bill and what makes it right-wing in your estimation. But the way you describe Part C, Sloan will see it one more time, the way you describe Part C, I didn't hear you disagree with it. I don't know how anybody who believes Israel should be the Jewish state would say that no, an, a, an Arab political party in the Knesset has the right to self-determine that in Israel there shouldn't be a Jewish state, there should be something else, Arab, binational, whatever. Explain to me why that is in any way a hot-button issue, Khaviv. There is in this land, uh, it, it is a hot-button issue. It goes to um, exactly what drives the tensions between Arabs and Jews here. There is in this land a contest between two different national identities. Israeli Arabs, many of them are deeply integrated into Israeli society. Many of them are proud to be Israeli. Yes. But at the end of the day, they, they, they are still an ethnic minority in a nation state of another nation. Yes. And that is, that is a source of tension. And that's a source of tension for Israeli Arabs who are proud Israelis. Israeli Arabs... You know, we have Supreme Court justices who are Israeli Arabs. That's right. And what that means is our Supreme Court is a very powerful institution. We have Israeli Arabs who, uh, you know, have oversight of the uh, Israeli nuclear program, because the Supreme Court, of course, also has oversight of those kinds of, of, of things. It's not just assuming there is an Israeli nuclear program. I'm an Israeli journalist, I have to say that. Um, but so there, there is a, you know, there are Israeli Arabs who are deeply, deeply loyal and proud Israelis and still have a problem with, for example, Hatikva. This was a famous case of Salim Jubran, Supreme Court Justice, yes. who at a state ceremony has trouble singing Hatikva, which he talks about Jewish yearning. He doesn't sing it. He doesn't sing it. Right. And, and he stands and he respects and he says in an interview about it, right. you know, I, I have a deep respect for it. I don't have a Jewish soul. I have a soul. We all have the same soul, but mine happens to not be a Jewish one. Yes. So why am I going to sing about the words Jewish soul in the anthem? So there's a complexity here, and it's real. It's a tension that's real, and it's real for Arabs who are proud Israelis. Now, some of the Israeli Arab community feels much more connected to Palestinian nationalism, for obvious reasons. So there's this contest where you have a 20% minority in, a, in an ethnic nation state that feels like, it, in some part of it, and you know, all of it feels a tension, some of it really feels like it belongs to a separate nationalist movement with other nationalist demands. So when the Israeli Arab leaders in the 2000s start demanding 
These are not 1% of the population. There's 20% of the population. They start demanding that the Jewish state be dismantled in, in the Israeli legal order, in the Israeli sort of sense, in the identity of the state. That draws a response that says, no, actually, this has to be affirmed, and this has to be clarified, and this has to be put into constitutional, given constitutional status. And what's wrong, um, what, Khabib, what's wrong with that Jewish response? Well, I'm not taking a side, but I can tell you the criticisms that, that, uh, from very, very serious people. So you have uh, one criticism that says um, the state of Israel is Jewish. It, it, it's obviously Jewish. It's Jewish because most of its population is Jews, and that majority population of Jews want it to be Jewish. Now, what's the point of passing a law declaring that it's Jewish? The day that most of Israel isn't Jews, or that the Jews in Israel don't want there to be a Jewish state, it won't be even if there's a law. And, and, and if, they, if most of Israel is Jewish and they want a Jewish state, it will be whether or not there's a law, right, without a law. What does the law give you? By the way, right, I right find, now, I'm sorry, yeah. I find that not, it's more, it is less than weak. It's, it's irrelevant. Your point is well taken, by the way. If sometime there are no more, that Jews are no longer the majority, something went really, really wrong. But for a state to say to a population that is saying to it, we want a different national determination in the state that we are citizens of. And the state says, just a minute, understand that if you're in Israel and you're an Israeli citizen, the state is a Jewish state and the only group that can practice self-determination is the group for which this state was created conceived, made into law by the League of Nations, and then ratified by the United Nations. To me, this is a non-issue. And I am sure you are correct that there are Israelis who make a big deal of this. But as I look at it, Chaviv, I can't see it. Now, I want to ask you a question. We're taping right now, and everybody should understand, you stayed up late at night to be on JBS in, in the news. Can I impose upon you to stay a little longer? I'm, I'm here. Okay. We're going to pause with our discussion, in our discussion with Chaviv Retegur, again, a journalist, and a, a brilliant journalist with the Times of Israel. You can tell just by listening to him, he brings... Uh, enormous both balance, insight, nuance, and that's why I love having him on. And we as American Jews need to understand the Israeli perspective more than we need the AJC, more than we need the URJ, more than we need the JFNA. We need to understand the Israeli perspective. Chaviv is giving that to us. When we come back with our next edition of In the News, we'll have part two of our meeting with Chaviv Retegur. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, and the producer of this edition of In the News, Tisha Bader, sitting in for Carol Lilienthal, who is on vacation. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.